folks in the room, if you, hello, folks in the room, if you have a device and you want to follow along, the slide deck is going to be your mechanism to do that. And that is at the following address. I will put it in the chat again for anybody in the room remotely, but then I will also say it out loud for you in the um, in the room there vocally. So it's a bit.ly, bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash capital A, capital E, capital M, AIM, and then center with the C being capital, capital N, capital J, capital A, capital T, capital S, 22, bit.ly forward slash AIM center, N-J-A-T-S, 22. Right. So I think we'll go ahead and get started again. We just had a little warm up uh, for those of you that are in the room there. Um, the, the folks in the in the virtual room here had just a, a little bit into the slide deck already. So we'll get going again. Um, so I just to introduce the session. This is creating and curating accessible content for the classroom. Um, I, my name is Maggie Pickett. I am with the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. For those of you um, who are not familiar with the AIM Center, we are a center, uh, a technical assistance center funded by OSEP, the US Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. Our focus and our goal, well, we'll get into our goal as a center in a minute, but our focus is really creating accessible learning experiences for kids. And I shouldn't say kids, because really, we're not just focused K-12, we're focused on early learning, K-12 and post-secondary, workforce, um, whatever, whatever that, that journey looks like for, um, for young adults as they, as they kind of get on their way and, and move on through, through, their, through their field. Um, so we are so excited to be here with you all today, and we're really going to focus on some fun things creating and curating um, in the classroom. So let's get started. Again, if you have any questions, if you're in the room, please feel free to um, raise a hand and, and we'll have um, your, your room advocate there advocate for the question and we can kind of get that communication going. Anybody in um, Zoom world, please go ahead and put your question in the chat and I can, I can relay it. Or if you want to come off um, mute and ask your question, that will work just swimmingly as well. All right, so let's get rolling. A couple of kind of housekeeping things. Um, right off the bat. And first, this is our accessibility commitment. So the National AIM Center, we are committed to providing accessible materials um, that, that anyone, all of the, the, the continuum of folks' um, abilities can access and use. And so our content today, we've used the acronym POOR. Mark that down because we're going to be looking into that a little bit later, but we've used the acronym POOR and used strategies um, under this acronym that we'll, we'll get into, and we'll dive in in just a little bit to ensure that this slide deck is accessible for you all. So if you do have any um, difficulties either physically accessing the slide deck in, um, in Microsoft SharePoint, or if you have access, um, difficulty navigating or um, getting access to the information on the slide deck, please let me know in the chat or your room um, facilitator, please. All right. Next is just a language check. So for our session today, I will be primarily using people first language. Um, uh, I am not a person that identifies with a disability. So, um, and OSEP, our funder, um, suggests that we utilize people first language. But do know that um, if I did have someone here today and they were using identity first language, that's completely acceptable as well. All right, and just a wee bit about me because this I'm I'm not important. The content is important, um, but just a little bit about my background. So my name is Maggie Pickett. I'm a senior technical assistance specialist at CAST. I work on the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials, the National AIM Center. I also work on a project called the Center on Inclusive Technology and Education Systems sites at CAST, um, and that's my that's my Twitter handle there at Maggie P underscore A T. Um, you can see it by my credentials. I am a certified speech language pathologist turned AT specialist turned systems thinking person. And um, now I get to just have a lot of fun. Um, seen, as a senior technical assistant specialist, I spend my time with um, states and districts, coaching, mentoring, providing professional development to groups like you. Um, I have a lot of fun doing it. 
But the really important group here today and people in the room today are you all. I would love it if um, now the folks in Zoom land have already shared a lot of their backgrounds and boys for you folks in the physical room. Uh, we've got a lot of great people here online today with us in Zoom. Um, so I would love it uh, if, if, if um, maybe just a raise of hands um, in the room there. And, and when I say raise your hands, I don't mean like raise your hand like this. I mean, like you're going to have to kind of do one of these so that we can see you. <laughs> um, but if we could just kind of take tabs on who's in the room in there. Um, so I just kind of go through some, some roles. Any AT specialists in the room? Yeah, I see a couple of hands. Hey, there you go. Uh, good. Um, any, let's see, any K-12 educators in the room? Okay, fantastic. Any administrators or program coordinators? Okay, all right, cool. We got, we got a lot of hands in there. Thank you, that's helpful for me. So I can really kind of speak to the experiences that um, you all might be living. So thank you. We'll keep rolling here. Now, can I just check on my timing real quick before we um, heave into the, into the content? Is this finish time 1.50? as it said on the schedule, or will it be two o'clock? One fifty for us. One fifty. Okay. All right. So we're going to kind of fly a couple of, um, just to let you know, I, I do work from home when I'm not jet setting across the country, visiting districts and, and conferences. So um, you might hear little voices. I do have some children at home. You might also hear a puppy dog. Just don't mind them. We'll keep doing our business here. All right, so these are our, our goals for today. We're gonna to work through a couple of protocols, a couple of kind of strategies for, for folks to use. Um, and these strategies, if you're kind of somebody who's out there teaching about accessibility, we're gonna give you a lot of resources you can take these strategies and implement them and teach them and train others on them. Um, we're gonna look at a couple of web tools to kind of check documents and presentations. Um, and then we're also going to look at the AIM Center website. And like I said, we're just going to be giving you all kinds of resources to take and use, okay? So that's that's kind of our goal today. If you want to take just a minute and think about your goal, folks in the room, if you've got a piece of paper or you know a little sticky note on your desktop, um, on your on your device, or but um, we're just I'd love for you to think about your goal for today. And folks in Zoom room, if you want to take a take a minute, think about your goal and put it in the chat again. That helps me just really kind of. Um, try to personalize this learning experience today. And while you're doing that, I will let everybody know um, that this is going to be a little bit of an interactive session later. Um, not majorly, I don't expect you to um, bring your picture up or anything, but just it'll be kind of uh, a little interactive experience. So we'll get rolling. You guys wanna be thinking about those goals. All right, so a little bit, we're gonna do just a little bit about the AIM Center. So. Like I said earlier, the goal of the AIM Center is to build capacity of states, districts, and other agencies, right, that are serving um, from twinkles to wrinkles, as Luis Perez likes to say, um, every, anybody and everybody that requires the use of high quality accessible educational materials and technologies. And we also like to focus on that timely manner piece. Um, it's one thing to, to get access to materials days down the road, weeks down the road, but, but really focusing on um, getting, getting folks their learning materials in a timely way. And again, we are focused pre-K, early learning, birth, um, all the way up to, to gray hair folks who are, are, are needing access to those materials. So let's get into it. I know a lot of you, this is gonna be speaking to the choir, um, but we really, every time we come together, it's important that we have a shared common understanding of the why around accessibility. So right now we're just gonna kind of dive a little toe dip into that so we can gain some common understanding. All right. And to do that, I move my chat box in. Yeah. To do that, we're gonna hop over and watch a video. Oh, you know what I'm gonna do folks because when I shared, I didn't press the magic button that gets the share sound going. All right, goodness sakes, here we go. So this, and the link to this, I'll share it in the chat while the video is playing. Um, here we go. 
Technology for me is probably my best friend. I would describe technology as my right hand man. Without technology, my life would look very different. That's for sure. I've been able to accomplish so much that I couldn't before. Technology has really come a long way and it's helped me so much in school, in my social life, and everything in between, um, traveling. So it's just, it's been life changing. The iPad really for myself and for my students that are low vision um, has really been revolutionary for us to enlarge text. You're able to invert the text where you have a light colored text on a dark background to take pictures and videos of objects. You know, it might be a, an object on a, on a board or an object on my student's desk that I'm unable to see, so I'll use my camera. I could not be in any of the classes I am if I didn't have like the technology that I use um, like ready and available for me. With ADHD, it's really hard for me to sit down and just type. And I've been using voice to type to get rid of some of that barrier. Amazon Alexa or Google Home have opened such a wide range of doors for me because literally all I have to say is, hey Google, turn on the light. And it's done and I don't have to worry about Oh, did the last person that I was with leave this remote in a location that I can reach it? I think the main accessibility feature that I use is voiceover. It takes the visual information that's on the screen and it translates that into speech so that even if you don't have vision, you can still know what's happening. I think you, Ella using Bookshare as much as she does where she is listening to the text and seeing it highlighted in front of her has definitely changed the way she reads out loud. You know, her reading scores have gone up every year and the only thing we've done is use Bookshare every year. I've just loved video games ever since I was little and no matter how hard my vision will get like really bad or anything, I will always keep playing because I really enjoy the stories. I love running around in the world, seeing what I could find. It has been the one thing that has kept me afloat, we'll say. Whenever I find a game that is accessible for me, I, I feel uh, relieved. I can actually uh, include my friends in something and not feel um, left out and I can actually have fun. I think, uh, especially with the amount of disabilities there are, uh, just the slightest bit of accessibility goes a long way. I think it's important to put yourself in our shoes to consider, you know, what if the text is too small? What if it's there, there are no auditory cues? What if th this could be something that causes eye fatigue? I would simply start by having a conversation with people that have disabilities and say, what would be helpful for you? What are some struggles that you would have with using it and what could we do to make it easier? The, the technology that we have available for our students can make the difference and can help them to be um, independent, uh, self-sufficient, confident adults. Every single day and every single class period, we utilize technology to make it as accessible as possible. I mean, we can't go without it. Wow. Um, I know for a lot of you that um, hearing those stories is all familiar, right? Um, but these videos are such a great way for folks that maybe don't hear those stories often to gain access to the stories and the students. Um, so anyway, thank you for uh, following along and, and, and having a listen. Um, now, let's do this. Um, Let's keep going. So when we think about the people in that story, really it boils down to their user experience with these products, with these tools, with their learning experiences, right? Um, and it boils down to that user experience being accessible, being usable. And so this video does a really great job of, of helping us understand the experiences that those students are, are coming into contact with on a regular basis using their technology to access their learning and perhaps what happens when 
it's, things aren't accessible. But now let's kind of fold over into um, what are what's the, some of the guidance? What are the things that we should be aspiring to, um, as laid out by our federal partners? So this um, this is actually a functional definition that was provided of def of accessibility that was provided to us, all of us as educators, from the U.S. Department of Education and uh, Office of Civil Rights in 2010. So um, really, accessibility um, boils down to this. And this graphic, I'm gonna describe this graphic as we go. Um, but there is a graphic in the middle of the screen here. It's a box and it's got um, a, a chunk of text. So I'm gonna walk us through it. The definition basically says that a person with a disability can do three things. They can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services. And then it gets substantiated on the other side. And this is the really the part that kind of puts the rubber, rubber to the road here. They can do those three things in an equally effective, equally integrated manner and with substantially equivalent ease of use as a person without a disability. So the video we watched is kind of the why, why are we doing this? And this definition gives us the what, what are we doing? What do we need to be aspiring to? It's really kind of a powerful definition when you start to, to tease it apart. Um, essentially what it's saying here is that when kids go come into their learning experiences, they should be able to access whatever it is um, and, and do this and, and interact and, and enjoy all of the things, all of, all of the things kids should be doing in the classroom and do that in a way that's effective and usable for them in a way that's integrated so that um, they're not having something different or, 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 or alternate, right? Um, and, and that's, at a, in a in a way that's equivalent ease of use, so it's 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 easy to use, just like a, a person without a disability. So um, this definition is really powerful. I'm going to share in the chat um, a web page to the AIM Center website where we really kind of explore the definition of accessibility a little deeper, going to accessible materials, accessible technologies, assistive technologies, and how these things kind of work together to really kind of aspire and, and, and work toward this definition within our learning environment. So when we think about um, having materials and technologies work toward that definition, um, we need both things to be accessible. We're gonna talk today mostly about the materials but it's also really important that the hardware and software that we're purchasing um, be accessible as well. So just as kind of a little bit of a, um, in a preface to what we're getting into, we're really focused today on the materials, but just know that those technologies are really important as well. And we call that tech, uh, accessible material technology synergy when things work together, right? Um, so you can't have one thing that's accessible without the other to, to really kind of aspire and meet that, that definition. We're gonna keep going. So like the title or the description said, calling all content creators and curators. Um, educators these days, whether you are an AT specialist, whether you are an administrator, a teacher librarian, a special education teacher, a gen ed teacher, uh, a secretary, right? An administrative assistant in, a, in the front office, we are creating and curating materials at a pace that was really uh, unthought of even just um, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, students are creating and curating materials, right? And so um, when we think about those experiences, those lived experiences that we heard in the video, it's really important for us to think about how to create um, and curate things that are accessible. So here, let's get into the meat and potatoes and really start to think about um, ways that we can do that within our classrooms. So I'm a really big proponent of making sure that everybody, we're all on the same page and have clear common understanding of things. So why not start with the definition? The definition of curate is a verb. It means to select the best or most appropriate, especially for presentation, distribution, or publication. So in this way, teachers, educators, whoever you are, we are constantly curating materials, whether it's um, content we're pulling down, te Google templates, Google document templates, um, Google sheets, we might be doing uh, Pear Deck templates, right? We are curating all of these pieces of information that we're then filtering and pushing to 
the folks that we're, we're supporting or trying to train or, or if we're, we're teachers, practitioners in the classroom, the students that, that we're, we're, we're supporting in the classroom. And so this notion of curating, ensuring that the things that we're curating is accessible um, is really, really critical. So how can that be achieved? The AIM Center loves itself an acronym. So the acronym that we use is POOR. Now, um, the AIM Center didn't just pull this one out of thin air and magically like here's POOR. Uh, the acronym POOR actually comes from um, the WC3 World Wide Web Consortium, their um, web content accessibility guidelines. It comes from their web content, initi web content accessibility initiative. And those guidelines have really said they're technical stuff for web designers. I don't know about you, but I, I do not, con I consider myself a curator and a creator. I am definitely not a, a web designer. I don't have those technical skills. But what's cool about the WCAG is what they refer to web content accessibility guidelines, WCAG, is that they've provided us with these buckets in this acronym, POOR to work from. So we can whittle this down into a really usable, nice little acronym, nice little tool for us to use, for us to train teachers on to say, hey, is my stuff accessible? Are my kids gonna be able to use this? Um, and that's POOR. It stands for perceivable, the O is operable, the U is understandable, and the R is robust. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit through this um, today. And I just want you to know, we're gonna hop through this pretty quickly. We've got a lot of stuff on the AIM Center website because I wanna to get to some of the um, creating stuff as well. And we, the time is, is, is magically disappearing on us. How does that happen so quickly? All right, so uh, the P, perceivable. Um, essentially what, needs, uh, what we all know needs to happen is that for folks with um, various sensory abilities, the material, <clears throat> the content that we're presenting, the content that we're presenting needs to be perceivable to it by various modes and means. So if um, we've got a student who is hearing impaired and they're watching a video, we've got closed captions. You can close captions, you can see it there. Um, for a student who is, is gaining access to a textbook, making sure that they have a brailled version of that textbook available. You can see here, um, there's an iPad or a tablet there and, and being able to change the color contrast. The gentleman, the, the TVI in the video had talked about um, changing the color contrast. And then um, the last one is, is focused on thinking about um, images as they occur in documents or presentations or whatever it may be and ensuring that those have alt text, alternative text. And so these are really, um, it's really about presenting the information that's being conveyed in more than one way and an alternate means, if you will, to that main mode. O is operable and this kind of speaks to itself. Um, but basically that the information that's being con conveyed is um, folks are inter able to interact with it in different ways. And so, um, and, and that means not just themselves independently, but also uh, through the use of their assistive technologies. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, um, the, the example there on the far left, there's a book that's open, it's um, on page one, and there's a table of contents on the left side. So putting a table of contents in an in a ebook or EPUB um, or a, a long document really allows folks to navigate and um, operate that, that document quickly. Um, but navigation styles, making sure that we have descriptive links, um, and then um, making sure that we have um, various ways um, to interact. So using a mouse, using a keyboard, and uh, voice commands. So lots of different, different strategies there under operable. We're going to dive into this a little bit more in just a second, give you some examples. Then we have understandable. Now as an SLP, I don't know why. Yes, I do know why. This is my favorite one. Um, this looks at not just the language. So making sure we're using plain text, making sure that we're using language um, that's at a, a readability level or an understandability level for our audience. But it's all, um, also translation. If we have an audience that needs translation, we're offering it in that format. But it's also about the structure and the predictability. So when I come to a website, 
um, I can predict the navigation. I can predict what's going to happen on the page um, based on based on previous experiences within that same page or that same design structure. Um, and so the the graphics on the screen kind of show that same thing, having different. Um, we've got translation. We've got um, different links. We've got um, content that remains the same across mobile. Um, and finally, we get to robust. So this is, if materials are robust, it means that it's going to stand the test of time, that it's um, the, the design is, is designed according to those four principles. This is really, if you're a math person, this is like you're checking your problem, right? We always say, check your work, check your work. This, the robust, this is all about us checking our work and making sure that what we've done gets us to the place that we want to go. Um, and we do that through the use of accessibility checkers. We do that through um, just checking, um, pulling up the content. I don't know if you can see that on a mobile device um, to see if it, if it remains in the same context in the same format that you designed it in on that other device. So let's go into the AIM Center uh, website now and we will take a look and then I will put the link in the chat for anybody that wants to follow along, but this too is a bit.ly. So it's bit.ly forward slash capital A, capital E, capital M dash lowercase vetting, V-E-T-T-I-N-G. All right, so let's hop on over there. Oh, and there's um, that link that I had put in earlier. Um, this is that what is accessibility defining accessibility page. I meant to pull that up. Um, but here we are at the vetting for accessibility page. Yay. So when we come into contact, like I said, we um, as as content curators, we are consistently coming into contact with new products, new tools, new templates. Um, we may not be designing them explicitly, but we can check for um, robust design. Um, and maybe it's not robust design. So a few ways to do that. Um, first of all, this is uh, this video that's, uh, there's a video on the screen here. And there, this video really um, gets at some of these design questions and some of the conversations. So this is a great, this is part of our uh, accessible learning across the lifespan series. If you haven't checked out this series, please go do so. There are a lot of great videos in here to use, to embed, to, to share with folks. Um, so is it perceivable? I love this page because it gives some actual questions to be checking and asking yourself as you're pulling up new content. So if I pull down, if I've got a new, maybe a new LMS, let's start there. If I've got a new LMS in my system that I'm being asked to use, I can go and check and see if it's, um, if it's accessible by looking and asking myself these questions. Um, does the material or does the does the digital tool provide options for customizing display? So what does that mean? Adjusting the, the text size and background um, to see color contrast. Does the material include accessible art alternatives for embedded media? Or does it allow me as the designer in an LMS uh, an option to, to tag those alternatives for those embedded media? Um, does the material include accessible art alternatives for notation? So thinking about math equations. So these are really great questions that can kind of um, lead us into um, what we need to ask. For more information, more questions, you can follow the link. I love the AIM Center website. It's just, it's just so full of great tools and resources. Um, is it operable? So this is that... Um, this is that navigation, making sure that we come, we have the structure, we have the navigation ability. And one way to do that, um, an easy one, and I could show you this one right now, is the No Mouse Challenge. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the No Mouse Challenge. If you're not, you can visit um, this link right here. It will take you there. It's also a um, hidden slide in the slide deck with the same link. Um, but essentially what it is, is it's testing keyboard navigation. So testing and key, keyboard navigation can also test for switch navigation, right? So if we've got a student that's using keyboard navigation or switch navigation, we can set them up. So if we use, I'm right now tabbing on my keyboard, and what I want you to see, I started up at the, um, the, at the website um, code there, and then it just starts tabbing through the website. And you can see that the structure 
Um, ooh, once we get to those, these are really dark backgrounds. I can see where I'm at. We move along and it also allows me to sh um, shift tab and move back and forth. So our website, as far as that operable, the structure goes, it's pretty darn accessible. Um, there are some other um, questions here to be asking ourselves when we come into contact with those new digital tools. One that I think is really important that sometimes we don't ask ourselves, does the material avoid the use of flashing content that could trigger a seizure? Um, a lot of times new video that we have or um, we're pulling video in and even some of the credits, some of the, um, is enough flashing to kind of get, get some neurons firing in a way that we don't necessarily want them to. And so these are just questions that you can ask yourself or you can train or talk to teachers about asking as they're looking for content. Then is it understandable? Again, these are probably my favorite qu questions. Um, I keep checking the time. I think we've only got, <laughs> oh my gosh. And then is it robust? So um, some things to really look for. Um, I think this did go a really long way. Um, does it work on different operating systems and platforms? If I pull my LMS up, if I pull this digital tool up, does it work across every single type of, of technology that we have in the district? Does it need special plugins to work? If so, it will be accessible. Um, are there copyright protections that would um, keep us from being able to manipulate the content in the way that we need to? But then also, does the tool, digital tool or product have an accessibility statement? What is the company stating about their accessibility um, practices and, and priorities in their, um, in their work and in their product? So those are just a few things to kind of think about. Let's hop back over here into the slide deck. Um, all right. Like I said, I think we've got, according to my watch, about eight minutes left. It's not enough time. So now we're thinking about content creation. We talked a little about, a bit about create, curating uh, content and materials, things that you're not creating. Uh, but now the verb create means to bring into existence, things that you are birthing um, from your own drive, wherever that might be, Microsoft, Google, right there on your desktop. Um, and so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, when we create, we're focused on accessible documents and presentations here. We've got a whole section on math, we've got a whole section on video. Um, so we can go a lot of places with this. Um, but there are five practices that educators, practitioners, Heck, anybody who's creating material um, can use that would have a significant impact on the usability of that product or of that tool that's being created. And that is SLIDE. Again, we love ourselves an acronym. So SLIDE stands for styles, links, images, design, and evaluation. It's similar to POUR, but it's really getting tightly connected to, um, to the content that um, to the content that, that we need to really specifically design um, presentations and documents. Uh, one of, all right, so here's the link. And I'm trying real hard to share all these yummy links. They're also in the slide deck. So if you're not catching these or saving them as we go, no worries, um, save that slide deck somewhere and you will have them forever and always. And, I'm not sure I said this at the beginning, I'm not sure I had our uh, Creative Commons license. Anything that I'm sharing with you, videos, content, um, some of the pages I'm about to show you, any of the content on our website, it's all openly licensed through uh, Creative Commons license. It's just CC BY. So you use it, copy it, paste it. Um, if you wanna give us attribution, please do so, but but really it's, it's for you all to use freely um, and as, as often or as um, much as you'd like. So here we are at the Creating um, Accessible Documents webpage on the AIM Center website. Like I said, if we look at this pull down menu um, at the top navigation under Create, there are a number of sections here that really allow us to think about creating not just documents and presentations, but EPUB publications, video, STEM, including math, uh, websites, and then social media. All the information is there is yours to have. So please feel free to explore that. For today, we were just really focused on creating accessible documents and presentations. 
And boy, we are whittling down time. Holy buckets. Um, so I'm not going to do what I was hoping we could do. Uh, we were going to do a I do, we do, you do um, using the slide. So slide stands for styles, um, using styles. So we're just going to hop into it. Yeah, we're going to give it a whirl, see if we can make this happen. So down here at the bottom of the page, it says, try it yourself. Now, if you're a Microsoft person, download the Microsoft document. If you're a Google person, grab that Google document, okay? Um, I have done that already, and we can do this together. Oh, it looks like so many things. This is fantastic. Um, and we didn't have, I'm gonna make a copy of this because I'm not sure I did it. Um, if you are in there, this should be a forced copy. I apologize. Um, if you are in there and you wanna try this, go ahead and make a copy for yourself, a forced copy in, in Google. Um, so over, um, so using styles, that's the first one. We can go ahead, see this menu right here. We can use our style guide. Um, I Little hot tip, the title, screen readers don't pick up title. Um, they pick up heading one. So if you just skip right over that tile, title and subtitle and just use heading one for the top of your page, that's the best option for us. Um, and then here's look at include alternative text for images. Um, I think that's, I think that's a heading two. I think that's part of our structure here. Let's see. Oh, click here. Links. Instead of saying click here, they want us to visit web aim. So we're going to go in here and do a descriptive link. Visit web aim to learn more. And then I can go in here. Oh, and I lost the, and I can say web aim. Uh, there it is. Ooh. Okay. So this is really, we're just running out of time. Um, links, images. Hey, alt text. We can grab some alt text and you can place your alt text right here. Um, so making sure that images have um, different ways that they can be perceived. Um, what's next? E, E. Let's go back. Um, oh, D, we're on D, design, so color and visual appeal. Um, so the color contrast is another thing. Um, where could we work on that here? Um, mm, making sure this color contrast. So we have a, I'm just gonna use my color contrast <laughs> word. We're just running out of time, guys. Um, so anyway, you can use color contract uh, checkers, but you can also use, Grackle Docs to check for your color contrast. Um, and we are just, we are almost out of time. And there was direction to finish on time. So what I love about this, let's just hop back over here. Oh guys, um, there are a whole playlist where Luis Perez, the guy goes through and does each of them um, in, in each of these uh, pieces of this acronym and slide. So he does styles, links, images, design, and evaluation. These are little short little videos where he is teaching you um, how to implement these strategies. They're really great. Again, pull these videos, pull them into your LMS and train your teachers, um, lots of options. And then once you kind of go through and learn some of these things, you can go back and do this, try it yourself and actually have time to work through it and think about it and do it on your own. Um, there are um, some other additional resources. If you like the content here, there's some additional resources down at the bottom that might also be of interest to you. Um, and for those of you, again, who are just pulling up the slide deck, um, these are all the links when we're thinking about designing for accessibility um, to our website. So we've got them all, all um, knocked out for there, there for you and you can access them as easily as you can. Um, I just provide the resources. So some final thoughts, that time went quicker than I wanted it to. Um, and I, I am so thankful that you were all able to join today. Hopefully we met our uh, goals for this session. We didn't get to do the strategies or show many of the web tools, but I will tell you that all of those videos and those great resources on the web pages will walk you through step-by-step. Step. So tag them, save them, um, and go back and revisit if you're interested in checking those out. And again, please use all of our resources. 
And as we always say with accessibility, we are all always learning. Um, I have been doing this for um, 10 years and I am consistently learning from my colleagues. I know you're training other people or you're constantly learning, but what we know is that when um, you do the best that you can until you know better and then when you know better, you do better. And I love that Maya Angelou quote. And we at the AIM Center often end with that quote because it, it really captures um, the experience and the journey of, of implementing accessibility strategies. Yes, Hannah, I can share that uh, presentation in the chat with you. Let me pull that up real quick. Thank you. Um, and, you know, really quick, are there any questions? Um, I, don't, I think we're over time. Um, if you have questions, let me put it this way. The link to the slide deck is in the chat. This is our contact information. Please, that aim at cast.org. We, if people email us, or if you call, although we prefer email, or if you tweet us, um, we will answer your question typically within 24 hours. If it's over the weekend, we do wait till Monday. So um, please reach out if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you have needs. Um, even just reach out if you're like, oh my gosh, this is just filled a gap that I needed. And, and maybe it was a kudos. We'd appreciate that too. Um, so with that, there's nothing else. Um, this is our disclaimer from OFSET. And, and that's all, that's all she wrote for today. Um, let me stop sharing. Thank you for your time. And I apologize, we didn't get to um, get to some of the strategies the way we wanted to. Thanks, David.